And our next speaker is someone who is, I think, very well known in ELT, especially when it comes to the use of uh, technology and, and creativity within ELT, which is good because that's what he's here to talk to us about today. But if you do not know Nick Peachy, he's worked all over the world teaching teachers and developing innovation and creative products. He's a two-time British Council Innovation Award winner and has been shortlisted uh, six times now, I think. He... Um, he has um, or publishes and has created books such as Team Building Activities for the Remote Classroom, Digital Tools for Teachers, Thinking Critically Through Digital Media, Digital Video, a Manual for Language Teachers, Hacking Creativity, Conversation and Listening. And he's also co-edited a uh, 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 British Council um, uh, publication called ELT Classroom and Creativity and the Sustainable Goals product. I'm sure he'll uh, give you his contact details as we go through the talk, but you'll find him all over the internet. And he does do a really interesting newsletter that brings uh, brings you up to date about things that are coming going on, piece of technology to use and new materials there. So it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Nick to the conference. Nick, could I ask you to turn on your camera and your microphone? Great. So, Nick, over to you, and we're here if you need us. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us on your, your Saturday. Well, I don't know if it's your Saturday afternoon, evening. Could even be your Sunday morning, could it? Yeah, maybe in some places, depending on where you are. Um, hi there. Uh, yeah, this, this session's on creativity in digital learning and teaching. And my, the main focus will be on the creativity part rather than and the teaching part rather than the digital part. So uh, I hope you're feeling creative because I'll try and get you to do a few things in the chat if that's possible. Um, just a bit of information my, about myself. Um, Beard's got longer since the, the photograph was taken, but luckily I'm in the same shirt, so you can recognize the picture of me. Um, as Sean said, yeah, I've been six times shortlisted for innovation awards and won twice, so that's my kind of uh, kudos and sort of my claim to authority there. Um, if you want to, if, if you have trouble following the presentation and you want to grab some of the ideas later, I'll give you a link to the presentation at the end. So all of the, the links and all of the information that you'll see, you will be able to get it um, through, through the link to the presentation. It's a digital presentation and it's based online. Also, if you're interested in finding out more about me, you can see there are these icons here to various digital media things. And, and these kind of link through to some of the things that I share through digital media, connected with teaching, creativity, um, uh, digital tools and things like that. So that you might find some of those useful if you want to check them out later. Oh, at least I hope so. If you don't find them useful, I've been wasting my time on quite a lot of it. Okay, I'll just move on. Um, uh, another connection with creativity, as Sean said, I was involved in, in uh, co-editing two books for the British Council on creativity, both of them, these two here that you can see on the left. If you get, if you get the presentation later, there's an icon here underneath it, and you can download those books for free. So do check out the presentation and you just click on here and you can download the book for free. Uh, the, the third one is a book that I wrote and produced myself called Hacking Creativity. This one isn't free, but, but you know, it's what many of the ideas that I'll be sharing in this presentation come from. You can. You don't have to buy the book. You can uh, take whatever of the ideas that you you like from the presentation and use them as as, as you, however you feel works for your students and and for you your style of teaching. Okay, so I'm going to start off with a question. If the if the chat isn't too busy for asking questions, why creativity? You know, why do we need to use create, or why should we be using creativity in the teaching of English language? After all, you know, we're we're English language teachers. Why why creativity? Maybe you can post your your answers through the chat. I'll give you a couple of minutes to think about that. Why is creativity important in English language teaching? Thank you. 
Okay, the, the chat's gone crazy now. With the, the, there must be a lot of you answering this. Okay, so yes, I can see some really nice answers coming through, but they're going very fast. Okay, I'll share you. I'll, I'll share. You've shown me yours. I'll show you mine. Okay, so why creativity? You know, first of all, I think, and primarily as English language teachers, you know, cre uh, create communication is a creative process. You know, the process of interacting with with someone, you're creating meaning the whole time. You're negotiating meaning and have to having to respond creatively. You know, much as the, um, some methods would like us to believe, you know, language and communication isn't a process of memorizing, you know, sentences and just regurgitating them. You know, that doesn't actually work too well when you're talking with a real person, you know, who, who's sharing ideas and sharing opinions. You know, you have to be creative in the way you use language so that's my first one my second reason is self-expression you know giving students the ability ability and the opportunity to to express themselves in the language which is a creative process again i think is very important and that helps embed the language in, in into their uh, into their memory or e even into their soul i might like to say um, it's life enhancement you know any any kind of cre creativity you do or creative work you do enhances your life you know i know you know music art literature all of these things you know have helped my life enhance my life and make my life better um maybe one of the least suspecting ones for many people is employability actually you know creativity is number three in the top 10 skills for employability over the next 10 years according to the world economic forum you know whereas many jobs are being threatened by mechanization and artificial intelligence and computers the ability to be creative is something that those things can't do so you know being being creative can help you become more employable, especially being creative in language, in, in English and in language. I think it helps a lot. Creativity can help you understand and solve problems, as we'll as we'll see in just a few minutes. It's a, it's a great tool for problem solving, and of course, creativity is one of our higher order thinking skills. You know, once we once we learn and assimilate it information the ability to sort of really work with it creatively is one of the true you know the true science that we're genuinely learning or have learned that language so that can really help to embed learning so lots of reasons for being creative okay so we're going to go on in a minute to how does creativity work, you know, but before we do that, I'd, I'd just like to share a little poll with you. And this is something that I do with all the, the, the teachers that I share this with. Uh, and I want to know how, cre how creative are you? And there are three little sentences here and you have to mark yourself out of 10. Um, I'm very creative. Do you agree? Disagree? I want to be more creative or it's something you're born with is creativity just something you're born with or, or is it something that you can develop i'll pass a link to the poll with you i'll just copy that and put it in a sticky message at the top let's see if i can get that sticky message put a link in there okay okay there should be maybe that hasn't worked Okay, I'll also give you um, voting instructions through QR codes. So if you have a QR code scanner, you can scan the code with your phone and um, you can also use this link and this code to, to enter, enter your, your response there. I'll try that sticking message thing again, see if that works. With the link, save. Okay, so at the top you should see the link and you can click on the link and fill that in there. I know lots of people are doing it through uh, through the uh, chat at the moment, which is again causing a, a bit of chaos, but that's okay. And then we can see the results of everyone's together because these accumulate together. And this is these are the averages so far from from sort of something like thirteen, nearly fourteen hundred teachers that I've done this activity with most view themselves as around 6.5 on the creative scale. Most want to be more creative, that's around 8.5. 8, 8 um, 
luckily most don't believe it's something that you're just born with so it's something that they can And uh, this is something that I got originally from a book called Zigzag, The Surprising uh, Path to great, Greater Creativity. And I'll share this with you right now. Somebody's saying there's no sound. Are, are we okay for sound? Do we still have the sound? Yeah, you, you disappeared for a second, Nick, but you came back. Hmm? Okay. I, I, I have a tendency to do that to disappear and come back. Okay, so oh, I'll just show you this. So for example, this, these are seven steps that make up a creative process. And the first step is to understand the challenge. And, you know, what that involves is, you know, looking at, at what you need to do, understanding the problem you, that you need to solve, and asking questions to dig into this more deeply. And here are some possible questions that you might ask when you're coming to under, understand a challenge, you know, what do I need to achieve? Who will it impact? You know, how will it impact people? What do I know about the problem or the challenge already? And what do I still need to know? So those are some examples of, sort of researching the problem and understanding the challenge first. And then there's this process of looking for solutions. And, and this is really about brainstorming and divergent thinking, you know, trying to think as, of as many possible ideas to solve the problem as you can, or many, as many different aspects or different ways to solve the problem, but not deciding on the first one you find. Often when people come up against the problem, they go for the first or most obvious solution to that problem. And generally that's not the best one or necessarily the most creative one. So be sure to brainstorm solutions to the problem that you need to solve. Step three is kind of evaluating those, those, those ideas and deciding which are the ones most likely to work, which are the better ones, um, which, which aren't so good, but not necessarily dismissing your bad ideas because they might come in handy later. So always keep hold of bad ideas. The fourth step in the creative process is then um, the, the, the convergent thinking and knocking those ideas together and, and thinking about which ones you can join together and which ones might make, make something new. And we'll come to, to that later on. And of course, another important part of the process is, is actually showing and sharing your ideas with someone because that enables you to get, get, get feedback and get more ideas and to develop the ideas. You know, that common expression, two heads are better than one or many hands make light work, you know, all of those things sort of work with creativity too, you know, to share your ideas helps you to, to clarify them. The next step, of course, is, is actually reflecting on any feedback you get, you know, because not all advice you're given, you know, is the best advice. And, um, and of course, deciding what advice you're going to take and how you're going to work with that. And of course, the last thing is sort of planning how you will produce something, you know, and not expecting it to be done in moments. You know. I, there's a historians believe that Leonardo da Vinci, when he painted the Mona Lisa, he actually spent something like 17 years create, painting it from when he started to when he finished. And he would go back and do another part and come back and, and do some more again. You know, creativity isn't an instant process. It isn't that flash of, of inspiration that, you know, so many of us associate with it, it, it with. You know, Mozart didn't just ha suddenly have a whole symphony in his head. You know, this took work and it took, it, it took process, a process. Okay, so let's go to the, the next slide. Hope you can see these. And the next slide is, is, um, is about convergent and divergent thinking. And this is going to be a, a little quick test for you. Um, which one of these do you think is convergent and which one do you think is divergent? 
Which is the green one? Is it convergent thinking or divergent thinking? I'll give you a couple of minutes to, to type that in. Which is the green one? Is it convergent thinking or divergent thinking? So green one, this side, the quality of ideas, sorry, the quantity of ideas is divergent thinking. So things diverge and that, that's the first part of the pro process. So you think of as many ideas as possible, divergent thinking green on, on the, the left hand side. And then you go to convergent thinking, evaluating and processing those ideas. And it's important that you, you do them in that order. Some people think of it uh, as some of uh, some people as being divergent thinkers and convergent thinkers. And it doesn't work like that. We can both all do both. You know, some of us are better at one than the other. But, you know, we should do divergent thinking before we do the convergent thinking, because the convergent thinking starts to switch on our judgmental side. And once we start to become judgmental, this inhibits the quantity of ideas. So it's better to go for divergent thinking first, generate quantity, lots of good ideas, and then the convergent thinking try to compress those ideas, going to more depth and, and evaluate them. So, and I guess the, the most common form of divergent thinking is really brainstorming. And just to, to sort of clarify thing, a, a lot of us do brainstorming activities in our classroom and, and, and assume that people know what brainstorming is. And brainstorming is actually a very kind of specific process. It could, should be fast and time pressured. It should be free of evaluation and without judgment. And it should be focused on quantity. So it's worth bearing those things in mind. You know, I've actually worked with a lot of people and a lot of companies who, as soon as they start brainstorming, they start judging each other's ideas. And then the ideas just dry up. And, you know, so that judgment and that, that starting to be uh, to, to be judgmental about ideas can really kill it if you focus on quanti quantity and time pressure you can get students to produce much more and more varied ideas convergent thinking of course works the other way it involves deeper research thinking more critically about ideas looking for commonalities making connections and you know that's where we turn on the very judgmental side of our brain at that point, you won't start generating new ideas, but you might find two ideas that work together well. OK, so let's just have a look at a few divergent thinking activities and, and then we'll do some convergent thinking activities and look at some of the senses. So, you know, brainstorming activities. Yes, you know, we all do the this is probably the most common one. We all do, you know, brainstorming ex, uh, 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 vocabulary. And it's something that, you know, you can do easily at the beginning of a lesson. If you're doing a lesson on art or culture or politics or, you know, um, charities, get st students to brainstorm the words they know first. You know, even get them to, to brainstorm them in their L1 if you want to, and then look at them afterwards and translate them if that helps. You know, but focus on quantity of words, you know, generate lots and lots of different words. And that's a great kind of way to way into the lesson. Another way of, of uh, taking advantage of brainstorming is, you know, getting students practicing to think about different ways of doing something. For example, you know, this is a, an activity that you could use as a warmer at the beginning of class. Think of all the ways you can collect water when it rains, you know, just use that as a, a warmer. Get students to think of as many ways as possible as that they can think of to collect water when it rains and put them in, give them three minutes, put them in groups, get them to work together and brainstorm as many ways as possible. They don't have to be sensible ways. They should be, you know, wacky ways or crazy ways. You know, they can catch it in their hands. You know, they can roll up a newspaper and catch it. They can find a carp basin as many ways as possible. Or it could be, you know, how many ways can you think of to cook an egg without using a cooker? 
you know, think of as many ways as possible. Could you lay it in the sun? You know, how could you do this? Could you put it on a heater? Maybe you could put it on, on the engine of your car to cook it. You know, uh, how can you get acro across a river without getting wet? How many ideas, as many ideas as possible. And, you know, these are great warmers to get students thinking outside the box a bit, using language and sort of, you know, sharing ideas together. So those are some of the brainstorming ideas. This is a, a kind of more language-based idea, and it's it's based around quotes. This is an activity that comes from the book, and it's it, it, it's I, I found a whole bunch of quotes and took a few key words out, and then students have to brainstorm ways to think to for how to complete them. So life isn't about finding yourself; it's about you know try and think of 30 ways or 20 ways that you can complete that sentence. You can type your own ideas in if you want to at the moment. Life isn't about finding yourself. Life is about, I've got experience, creating yourself. But the, the emphasis should be on as many ideas as possible, not just one that they think is the correct one, you know, as many ideas as they can possibly. Could be life isn't about finding yourself, life is about chocolate, life is about music, life is about dance, life is about love, you know, life is about, you know, bread, life is about politics. I don't know, whatever you want, as many as you can, you know. And there's a, I collected a whole bunch of quotes together in this activity here and, uh, you know, so I've got a collection of different ones that I can use with students. And then at the end, I can show them the proper answer, what, what the, the complete answer is. I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, you did, but people will never forget the time you made a mistake or, you know. So lots of different ideas. Just find some quotes, take some words out and get them to brainstorm different ways of filling it. If you want some digital tools for brainstorming, and this is the little digital tools bit, there's a tool called Mentimeter, which is very good for setting up these kind of, the, and making these interactive. So here's, here's an example of one. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see this, if it's clear enough, but this one was one that I used with teachers and I got them to brainstorm their biggest challenges. And you, I've got 113 different challenges that, that teachers commonly have. And you can check this one out. So this was just a simple you know, quiz that was sent up using Mentimeter, set up using Mentimeter. Another to, way you can use Mentimeter because there's lots of different kinds of interactions with it is like the vocabulary one, you can get students to submit words to a word cloud. You know, uh, what words could you we use in an essay about writing skills? And these are all words that were brainstormed. And these are easy to, to share, you know, you can, just create them very easy, set up, set up the sharing instructions, get students to scan them on their QR code and you know, with a QR code scanner on their phone and then they can just sim submit their words. You know? And that's a way of collecting all the words together. As students submit them, they appear in the, the word cloud here. So that's Mentimeter, which is a very useful tool. If you want something a bit more standard and, and very easy to use, you try CryptPad. Cryptpad is a is a tool for is a tool for creating. Some, it's a bit like Google Docs. It's a way of creating an, an instant writing pad that, that um, lots of people can work in collaboratively. But it just uh, creates a writing pad online, and they can use that for brainstorming. I'll give you the link to that one there through the chat. Get students to click on this link. And it instantly creates a writing pad for them that they can that they can write into. You can get the pick up the real links later. So those are two 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 good tools for brainstorming. Both of them work on mobiles, honestly. Okay, so in terms of convergent thinking activities and convergent, this is the where we start to become more judgmental and start to knock ideas together. Um, one of my favorite activities actually is to revise vocabulary is portmanteau words. You know, there are lots of these portmanteaus like shopaholic or, or what's another one, brunch, and, and actually sort of 
what you do is you get students to collect together 30 words that they've already learned that you want to, them to review and you get to them to see how many of them can they join together to make new words you can get them a few give them a few other other bits to work with if you like i mean some common modern ones are mansplaining at the moment you know we've got mansplaining when a man explains something to a woman that she already understands it's mansplaining you know but we can look for variations on that can we use that with something else you know so get them to use their their vocabulary words taking different vocabulary words and seeing how many they can use together to make a new word and then they have to decide how that word's pronounced and what does it mean how does the meaning change when you add those two parts of that word together and that really gets them thinking about you know the meaning of the words and also in some ways the, the pronunciation because if you come up with a new word you have to think about how it's pronounced where's the stress going to be and how is that affect affected so for me that's a nice kind of convergent thinking activity which sort of involves rever uh, revising vocabulary and uh, there are some great examples actually i found an ar article earlier on with some great examples of new words that were that were created um, one of my favorite ones there's, there's bedgasm is which that feeling when you go to bed when you're really tired Textpectation, when you're expecting someone to text you and they don't. Uh, this is the one that I really like, chair drobe. You know, everyone has a chair drobe. It's a, a kind of chair that's in your in your room that you use instead of a wardrobe and you pile up uh, you pile up clothes on it. So those are some sort of nice example portmanteau words, and you can pick up the link to that article later. Um, another idea for convergent thinking and getting knocking things together to make something new is to get students to take two stories that they know really well and try to make them into one. Try to get them to combine the plots to make one story from the two. So there's an example here, you know, can you combine the plot of Titanic with the plot of Frozen? You know, which characters would replace each other and, and how would that work? You know, th this comes from an idea that was very popular a few years ago. You know, um, people were rewriting every book as zombies, you know, Pride and the Prejudice as zombies, you know, and uh, all these sort of literary classics, but kind of combining zombies in with them. And, uh, you know, it's a kind of creative idea that, that helps you come up with something new. But, you know, just take any two pop plots and try to combine them together and look for the connections. In terms of grouping, this is another nice convergent activity in grouping. You know, you can instead, we do, often do this thing with odd words out, don't we, in English language teaching. You'll get, you'll have four words, they choose the odd word out, and maybe it's because of the pronunciation or it's because of the uh, word family, you know, three are verbs and one are nouns. But you can make this more creative by getting students giving students totally unrelated words and getting them to think of any reason for why one word would be the odd word out. I've got an example here. His four words, spotty, music, carrying, and laughter. And, you know, which word is the odd word out and why? You can think of any justification, not a grammatical one, not a linguistic one, but any kind of grammatical one. You could say that, you know, Music is the odd word out because it tastes differently from the others. Some of them are sweet, some of them are sour. Music tastes different. Or it could be, you know, spotty is the odd word out because I, I don't like the sound of it or it has a different sound. You know, they can think of any kind of, any kind of justification for, for choosing which is the odd word out. It doesn't have to be linguistic at all, but it gets them to think about the words in a more creative way. You can, there's a similar activity again, which is based around revising words, which is actually give students 30, 20, 30 words that they've, they've already learned and get them to divide them into groups and think of any justification that they can for grouping them. I actually use the, this kind of visual of, a, of buckets. They have to put all of the words into the buckets and they have to decide on what their criteria is for each bucket. And for example, 
for my, for my example, I've got what bucket number one is all of the red words. Number two is all of the sad words. Number three is words I like. Number four is words I won't use much. But they could put any classification underneath these to sort their words. No, it doesn't have to be anything to do with linguistics. Let your students be creative and think of their own justification for grouping these words. You know, it could be words that have a nice sound, that they just sound nice, or words that I don't like the sound of, or, you know, words that I think are sweet. Okay, so get them to analyze their words and drop them into those buckets. So those are a couple of ideas for convergent thinking and grouping things together. Um, this is another sort of activity that I came up with based around this kind of trying to, to mold things together. And it's based around sort of giving students two images of two different objects and getting them to try and invent something new from those two objects. You know, a great example is the printing press, which revolutionized, you know, the, the way we think in the production of books. You know, for example, the thinking press was actually a combination of a grape press and a coin press, and they combined them together and made a printing press. So that, that's, you know, that's a great example. So for example, if we look at this, these headphones and this bowl, what things could we invent that combine the two of those together? So get students start to start thinking and looking at different, trying to think of as many different things that they could invent by combining those things to, together. And in the activity I created, there were a whole sequence of these different images and it's called mashup inventions, and they, they have to combine two things together. So calculator and a bicycle. What could you make from those two, you know, if you combine them? Or, you know, a razor and some cheese. You know, how would you combine those together and make something new? Trying to think of as many inventions as possible you can come up with by combining those. You know. And that's a nice activity to sort of get students thinking and about convergent ideas. There's some nice examples in, in, in a couple of articles that I link to here. This one here has a really nice example, some really nice examples, 25 inventions that you never knew you needed. There's this really nice one of a, it's a, it's a, um, a, an ironing board that also can also be used as a mirror. So you kind of iron your dress on it first and then you put your dress on and you can look at yourself in a mirror. Revolutionary ideas. Um, there's an egg timer that that's, um, can be used as traffic lights is another nice one. This is a great one for language teachers. It's wrapping paper that's also a word search. So, you know, you can actually uh, yeah, recycle your recycle your present wrapping paper and turn it into a word search for your students. But you know, lots of different ideas of mashing up ideas together, joining them together, and and coming up with new ideas. And that's something that we can get our students to do just with those simple images. Okay, the, the next part of the presentation, I want to go on to sense-based activities because I think, you know, an important thing of, of encouraging students to be more creative is accessing a wider range of their senses, you know, because, you know, that engages them much more with the language and much more with the learning. Often, you know, for our students, you know, they're, they're over here and the learning is over there on the board and, you know, actually they don't want that to come too close to them. Whereas engaging their sentences, we can involve them much more on a, on a kind of deeper level, I believe. So these are activities that are based around senses. And the first one, you know, for the first group I, I like to use is visualization. And this is something that I use quite a lot when I, in my teacher training as well, is, you know, I like to get students to close their eyes and just try to visualize things. You know, just try to get them to visualize something. And we'll try this now if you're listening. Could you please close your eyes? I hope your eyes are closed now. Close your eyes and just try to imagine the last meal that you had. Think about the last meal that you had. Go okay, with your eyes closed. Don't say anything. Think about the last meal that you had. Think about how it tasted. What, what were the different flavors? When you started eating it, what did you start eating first? What part of the meal did you start eating first? What part did you leave till last? You know, 
who were you with when you wrote the meal? You know, what did it feel like in the, your mouth? Try to imagine the texture of the food in your mouth. You know, what did you drink with it? Okay, so those things you get students to close your, their eyes and visualize, and then they can discuss afterwards. So, you know, using this visualization before we go into speaking activities helps students to prepare a lot more of what they're going to say. So that, you know, they, they've already been through it in some ways in their heads, and then they go into, into talking about it. So you can sort of do that with, a, you know, for example, the last meal, and these are a few questions that you could, could eat. You could also do it the same thing with the last film that you saw, you know, get students to try and imagine the last film that they saw at the cinema, you know, can they remember the music to it? You know, can they remember who was in it? What happened at the beginning? Who did they go to the cinema with? So if they visualize these things in their mind silently first, and then go on to, to, to talking about them, that makes the, the speaking activity, you know, much easier for them, because they've had time to sort of mentally prepare and think of ideas. You can do a similar thing, actually, a nice activity is with, with a text. You can actually sort of dictate a short text to student, students, not dictate it because they don't need to write, write it down, but get them to close their eyes and just listen to the text, you know, and try to visualize it in their head. You could do this as a, as a, a kind of lit, a comprehension activity and then get them to write down what they remember afterwards, or you could actually do it as quite a creative activity. And so, for example, you know, if I get, if we try this now, if you close your eyes now and listen to this text, there are three people waiting for a bus. One is a man, is wearing a shirt and carrying a large bag. The women look at him suspiciously. Okay, so once you've imagined that in your mind, you can, uh, you, you can actually then start to get students to recreate that and compare what they what they heard or what they what they imagined you know was what color was the shirt the man was wearing you know how old was the wo woman how old were the women what was in the bag you know you, they can start to imagine other things around that so that's a kind of nice way to sort of get them visualizing before they before they actually uh, and elaborating on something that they've heard as a speaking activity no, I think using taste and smell is actually very, very much underexploited in, in English language teaching as well. You know, if you've got a picture in your course book, you know, and before with maybe it's a picture with a reading or a speaking activity, just try, you know, to try to get students imagine to imagine that they are in the picture. Tell them, ask them where they would be if you put yourself in this picture now, where would you be? And then start thinking about what can you smell? If you're in this picture, what could you smell around you? What could you hear? You know, what would people be say, saying? What kinds of smells would there be? You know, and that's a way to sort of get them into the material before you actually start, you know, the reading activity or the speaking activity or whatever it is. Um, another, also, it's nice to get students thinking about smells that evoke memories. You know, most of us have a kind of some special smells that are very evocative. For example, for me, if I the summer rain, you know, always makes me think about Cambridge, where I was born, where I grew up. You know, whenever I smell the, the, the rain after a rain shower in the summer, it has that smell or the smell of cut grass. Lots of people have to sort of smell associations that they associate with something. We can sort of build on those as well in, in a, an activity that I call tasty words. Again, going back to sort of re revision of vocabulary or learning vocabulary, whenever you're teaching new words to students, get them to associate a taste with it. You know, it, you could actually get them to group words into which ones are sweet, which ones are sour, which ones are salt, which ones are, you know, which ones are stringent, you know, get them thinking about the different tastes of words, or they could apply the, the flavors of fruit to different words, you know, which one is a banana word, which one tastes like apple, which one tastes like orange, you know, so get them thinking about their vocabulary and associating it with different fruits or flavors. You know. And that can sort of maybe help them to remember those words or at least think about them in a different way. One of the other things that, you know, a very visual part of it is, 
So I'll start that again. Sketching is a sort of very visual activity, I think, which re really helps students remember things. Research says that people who sketch or doodle while they're listening to something have higher retention of the information, which is very interesting. So if you're, if you're doodling now, that's great. You'll probably remember more of this. But if you see your students doodling, don't stop them. Let them go ahead and doodle. They're probably going to retain more of what they've heard if, they, if they're doodling. But we can also use that in our teaching. We can get them to sketch out sentences. So for example, if they're learning new sentences or they've learned a whole bunch of new sentences, why not get them to sketch the sentence out and draw a picture of each one? If you get them to compare different sentences, like we commonly get students to compare things like past simple against present perfect. So give them two sentences and tell them to draw the sentence. You know, which one is different? How are they different? You know, how do we conceptually you know, make a difference visually between those two things? So get them drawing out um, sentences when they're when they're comparing them, or or new sentences that they're learning as an ex as examples. You know, get them to produce a a, a sketch of it. Another thing that I like to do is is you know commonly when we get students to read or listen to a text, we get them to answer questions afterwards. You know, we have comprehension check check questions. Everybody does this. It's not a bad thing. But sometimes it's good to do something different. So instead of getting them to answer questions when they read a text or listen to something, get them to draw a representation of what they heard. So, you know, sketch what they, their comprehension, sketch out what they understood from what they heard. And that's a great way to sort of actually get them to start thinking about it in different ways. These sketches, if they collect them all together, you know, will help them remember the text as well. And then they can use the, text, the, the, the sketch to explain what they heard. And that's a nice way of sort of, you know, checking comprehension. And that way you check everything that they understood, not just the answers to your questions. So I think that's a really nice kind of comprehension check activity is just to get them to sketch the the, the text. They could even uh, create an infographic of it or something like that We're using an infographic tool if you if you if you'd like them to, to create infographics. The next one is uh, 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 another activity that I really like, and this is based around songs and music. You can probably see the guitars in the background. I, actually, my first teaching job was teaching guitar, so I was originally a music teacher, teaching guitar in, well, actually, my first job was teaching guitar in a prison, but that's another story. I'll tell you about that another time. I wasn't in the prison. I just went to the prison to teach the guitar. Anyway, I diverge. So song sentence revision, um, you know, again, going back to those kind of sentences that we teach students as examples, actually, you can get them to think about how they would sing them. Could, could everybody just think about your favorite song or a, a song that you really like now? Just think about a song that you really like. You can type in which one it is if you want to. But, um, so think of a song, okay. And once you've thought of that song, you know, I'll give you my example sentences, and I want you to try and sing the sentence to the tune of that song. So for example, my example sentence is, she did her best to help him. Here's my example sentence, she did her best to help him. So try and sing that, that sentence over and over again using the, song, the tune of that song. Okay. You don't have to do it out loud. You can do it in your head. Um, you can whisper it to yourself. Uh, if, if you do this with the students and you want the, and they want to sing it out loud, they can. But try and sing the, the example sentence to the, the tune of that song. Or it could be, here's another one. The frog jumped and landed in the pond. Try and sing, sing this sentence to that, the tune of that song. And what we're doing when we're doing this is we really have to start thinking about, you know, word, where the word stresses are, uh, where the sentence stresses and how we place that, how things are pronounced. So it gets us engaging with the sentence on a very different level to the kind of the grammatical, you know, parts of speech and all this kind of thing. It's a really different way of engaging with the sentence and, 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 try to, and trying to remember them, you know, but it, it gets them thinking about it in a lot of words in a lot of ways, not a lot of words. So that's something that you can do using sounds and music. 
Another nice way to use sound actually is if your students have got these phones, um, ask them to collect sounds on them, on them. Give them five specific times of day, choose five times of day. Could be Tuesday at three o'clock, Wednesday at four o'clock, uh, Wednesday evening at nine o'clock, but choose, choose five different times for them. Get them to set an alarm on their phone at those different times and tell them wherever they are, when that alarm goes off, they have to record what they can hear. Get them to record what they can hear. And then in the next class, get them to bring their phone in and share the recordings that they've heard and talk about them. So, you know, at five, and again, great one for past continuous, at five o'clock, I was walking along the street and I heard this car backfiring, or I heard these women speaking about what they were doing for their next holiday, or I heard this. So, you know, a nice warmer activity, just get them collecting sounds and listening a bit more. You know, I think sort of, you know, listening to the world, you know, often our students are self-obsessed with these phones. They spend lots of time to taking pictures of themselves. But if you can get them to actually use them to listen to the world and collect sounds and, and share them and talk about them, they can start listening to their world a lot more. You know, as, as a musician, and a, I was a fan of John Cage for a long time, who produced a, a song called Silence, which is, was just about musicians sitting silently while everybody listened. You know, we don't really listen enough to what's going on around us in fact we spend a lot of time blocking it out which is very sad i think so encourage your students to listen uh, another idea and again it comes down to the phone is 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 the you know get them to to take pictures as well and collect pictures again you can set specific times of day for them to collect the pictures if you want to and wherever they are you know this one's called five five random in, images so wherever they are at that time they have to find something to take a picture of you know, it could be a leaf it could be you know a bicycle wheel it could be anything as long as it's not themselves or another person no selfies just sort of look around you try and find something interesting that you can see and take a picture of it then when they come to the next lesson at the beginning of the lesson they can share these pictures talk about them talk about what they found and what they said what they were doing at the time so again it's past continuous i was walking down the street and i saw this man crossing and he had a very strange shoes on so i took a picture of his shoes you know so it could be these kind of random images at random times an alternative to that is that you you could actually set them photo photo assignments so collect collect uh, six photographs of you know faces or textures or pieces of wood or six photographs of leaves or six things that are triangular you know so so they c collect these photographs and they come to the next lesson and they share them and you know this is a, a triangle this is i found this while i was walking down the road or this is you know and they just sort of talk about those things and talk about those things that they find and again you know it gets them away from the selfie and the the, the kind of narcissistic use of the phone and gets them looking outside at the world again you know creativity really is about look you know and enhancing your creativity really comes from looking outside and being observant listening to things you know looking at things and trying to see them anew you know we take so much for granted of what we of what's around us that we're not really sort of focusing on you know what wonderful things there are just in front of us so you know it's good to get them sort of focusing on that and that will help to enhance their creativity too just look and see how much time i've got one of the things I shouldn't be look, blocking out. Okay, so I'm, I'm running short on time. So, so those those are sort of most of my creative ideas. Um, just a few things in terms of you know tips for for encouraging creativity in the classroom because you know a lot of teachers say it isn't easy. The students don't want to be creative. You know, it, it, you know, th these are some tips for maybe trying to overcome those kinds of things. You know, and I think the first one is, you know, you have to be prepared to be vulnerable yourself and willing to take risks and to, to sort of um, involve students. You know, it's, creativity is a very personal thing, you know, and if you set assignments for students, be prepared to do them yourself as well and be involved and, and do them. You know, sing the words of the, the sentence to your favourite song too, you know, collect five images yourself too and talk about them. You know, you, you you have to be willing to be vulnerable too. You know, be, the next one is sort of be an equal in the process of creation. 
you know, don't don't think that you have the best idea or that they should do it this way or do it your way. You know, but be equal. Let them let them sort of create things in their own way. Be encouraging. Don't dismiss any ideas or suggestions. There's no such thing as bad idea. You know, what's a what might seem like a bad idea could be a brilliant idea today, could be a brilliant idea by tomorrow. You know, try to keep keep things light, have fun with creativity. You know, creativity should be enjoyable, it should be funny, you know, we should really enjoy it. And I guess the last one is sort of be sure to assess la language, not their creativity. You know, we are still language teachers. So think about the language they used in the process, not what they produced. You know, don't criticize or evaluate their creativity. Focus on the, on the, the, the kind of language that they use to produce it. Uh, constructive criticism can be good, but, but focusing on helping students identify and build their own strength is much better, you know. So hopefully those tips can help guide you and, and you know, don't expect your students to instantly take to these creative ideas. You know, it, it would be great if they do and, you know, that might happen. But, you know, success is, is built, you know, in small steps and continuous steps and, and being persistent. So, you know, try and stick with it if you do try to be creative. Okay, I've got a um, any questions section here. Here's a questionnaire. Um, and here's the voting instructions. So if you do have any questions, um, you can either put them in the Q&A or you can use menti.com and this code, or you can scan the QR code and put them in as well. You know, the, so those are sort of a couple of different ways that you can enter questions. If you use the QR code or, or the menti code here, we'll all be able We'll all be able to see the questions, which can make them easy to answer. There are okay. a lot of nod in the Q and A box already, Nick. Just so you know. Are there? Okay, <laughs> I'll give you a couple of minutes to think of any other questions. I'll have a, a quick bit of water, and then I'll come back and try and answer them. Okay. Okay, let's see if there's any coming through here. This sometimes needs to be refreshed to reload. If they're not, we can just sort of do all the ones in the Q&A. No, nothing yet, but I'll, I'll hang with that. So, yeah, Sean, if you've got any questions in Q&A, by all means ask, or, or should I go and look for them there myself? Oh, first one, how to help students accept vulnerability. Um, it's a really good question, you know, uh, students aren't used to feeling vulnerable in our classes, often they're very detached from, from learning. And like I said, I think it is a long process, you know, you, you need to keep doing these activities and you need to, to do them gradually. And as long as you're not judgmental and you show them that it's fun, they will start to open up, you know, it's very easy to sort of close them down by being too critical or too judgmental so sort of be very careful about that but i think you know the, the way of course to do it is to lead from the front you know and be vulnerable yourself you know and and that will help them to 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 accept and be vulnerable too types of activities that will recommend to create introverted students thank you very much um no i think most of them we can do with introverted students you know i think a lot of introverted people are very creative and you know creativity is is you know a, 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 a strong element of the introverted learner so i think a lot of these can you can try with introverted students there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to do them uh, about music collecting sounds could you explain that one a bit more um the 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 music and collecting sounds collecting sounds is you know if if we if we use our mobile phones mobile most mobile phones like mine have something that you can record audio memos on so set them a time of day and tell them you know at 12 30 tomorrow stop wherever you are turn on your memo and record what you can hear record something that you can hear collect about four or five of those recordings and then they come and play them to each other in class or they can share them virtually here and they listen and play them and talk about what they heard and what they were doing at the time. 
what's a good activity for very young learners i think for very young learners you know the flavors of the words is a great one you know associating taste with words you know is something that they take to a lot because they're still very much in touch with their senses um my children are not exposed to english songs how can i train them to sing they, the song, you know, the song activity that I suggested about taking a sentence that's an English sentence and singing it, it doesn't have to be an English song that they use. It could be any song or any music that they know. You could even uh, pick a tune. For some reason, whenever I do that activity, I think of Madonna like a virgin, but you, know, that you could suggest a tune for them and try to get them to sing the sentences to that tune. It doesn't have to be an English one. And they don't have to do it out loud. You know, if you get them to sing, it could be singing silently to themselves or thinking about how they would do it. Uh, do you have some recommendations for further reading, ELT, related to creativity in ELT? Yeah, the three books at the beginning of the presentation, I'll give you the link to the presentation in a minute through the chat. But the three books at the beginning of the presentation, you know, um, all have more creative ideas in the first two from the British Council have about 20 chapters each from different authors with lots of creative ideas in. So pick those up or you can get my one hacking creativity, which has lots more ideas like this. In. What activities did you use to, to do in jail? Was it about English language teaching? What else? Um, where in I, I used to be a guitar teacher in the prison so i would go to uh, it was while i was a student i was studying music and i would go to the prison once each, each one evening each week and i would teach them to play the guitar and that was usually playing blues guitar actually and uh, so i would teach them how to play the blues um they were, they they had a natural affinity to it in a lot of cases so it was a nice thing to do i wasn't a very good music teacher though i have to say could you explain how words can have tastes? Um, how can words have tastes? Um, we have to sort of associate things with them and, and choose something. T words don't necessarily have tastes or flavors, you know, or colors. You can associate colors with words as well, but you can in encourage students to make that connection. Just give them five different fruits and say, all of your words have to be one of these different fruits and they will start to do it, you know. Please, could you share the links to three books at the beginning? Um, you'll get them once you, if you get the link to the presentation that has all of the links in. Again, I'm just going to pop the presentation link into the chat again, but it'll disappear quite quickly. It's in the sticky notes as well now. Is it great? Good. What kind of active, creative activities can be done by young and low level learners? Most of the words ones, the words connecting words, or even, you know, getting them to visualize, close their eyes and visualize things that you don't necessarily have to do them in the, the target language. It could be done in their first language if it makes it easier. Um, is Cryptpad the same as Google Docs, people having access to one same document online? Yeah, Crypt Cryptpad is very similar to Google Docs and it's based on the same technology, but it's much more easy, much easier to manage in terms of um, in terms of sort of access and managing access. And you can sort of create a pad instantly without lots of people having to remember their work password and sign up and those kinds of things. And it is open source, so nobody owns it. So Google won't own your, uh, your, your documents. How much should you set a time limit on all activities? Yeah, it, I guess, you know, you should set time limits on activities, but you know, that's up to you and, and how you fit it in your class, I think. Which of these activities do you mostly recommend for virtual hybrid classes? You know, I think most of these activities you can do in a virtual or a hybrid classroom. Um, it's just the way that you manage them has to be a bit, uh, a bit is a bit more complex, you know, um, and that really depends on how you've set up your hybrid classroom and what your platform is. So that's quite a complex one to answer. I'd really know, need to know a bit more information before answering how I would do it. How can teachers balance between creativity and differentiation in mixed ability cl large classes? I think creativity is great for mixed ability classes because, again, you know, you know, just because you're 
a, a higher or a, a lower level in, in terms of language doesn't mean you're a higher le or lower level in terms of your creativity. You know, that isn't associated with language. So students are still able to be creative and it naturally differentiates for them because, you know, but what they produce at the end of it in terms of language will be different. Yeah. Okay. If you give, the, if you get them to sort of create a story, somebody who's got a higher level of language will be able to do a grammatically more complex story. But, you know, they haven't necessarily got more creativity. So, you know, it won't necessarily be a better or a more creative story. So these are, are good activities to, to use for differentiation. You've probably got time for two more questions, Nick. Two more questions. Do the students need to be born with talent or creativity in order to create something? I would say absolutely not. You know, if we go back to the beginning of the presentation and that seven step creative process, you know, going through that process and designing your activities with students so that they work through that process, you know, I think is very important. And most of us know anyone who's done anything really creative knows that it's really hard work over a long period of time. It's not something we're born with. You know, I wasn't born playing the guitar and I'm not a natural musician. You know, I've worked at it over a long period of time. So you can develop it and be more creative. Do pre or priming activities in a lesson plan reduce creativity? Um, I would say it depends. I'd have to know more about those. Okay, I think that's all the time I have, I'm afraid. What I'll do is I'll go to my last slide, which has a QR code here, which if you scan it, you'll get the whole of the presentation with all the links onto your phone, um, which will open there. And or if not, the link is also in the sticky notes there. So if you can copy paste from the stick, sticky notes, or click on the sticky note. That will also open you know the presentation all of the links all of the ideas are in there the other books are there you know you and you know you can always contact me through the social media links that i've added there so thanks very much for listening sorry it's been quite a lot to fit into an hour but um, i hope you found some useful ideas there that you can use with your students and and that they will enjoy thank you very much thanks